Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for uh, research report with our two um, Korea Foundation junior scholars, uh, Che Ria or Ria Che, and and um, Che Young Lee, who is known affectionately to us uh, to the Wilson Center family as Claire. Um, before I introduce them, uh, I'd like to take a few moments to. Uh, talk about the Wilson Center, um, the History and Public Policy Program, um, and the Junior Scholars Program. Um, first, my name is James Person. I am a senior associate with the Center's History and Public Policy Program. Um, I spearhead the North Korea International Documentation Project. Um, it has been my pleasure uh, over the past uh, six months to work closely with, with uh, Ria and Taeryong um, as their direct supervisor. Now, for those of you who, um, who don't know, uh, the Wilson Center is the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It was founded by Act of Congress in 1968. Now, unlike the physical monuments um, in the nation's capital, this is a living memorial um, uh, whose, whose work and scholarship commemorates the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson. Now, as both a distinguished scholar and a national leader, President Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. Now, the History and Public Policy Program, uh, which is under the direction of, of Christian Osterman, uh, commemorates the ideals of President Wilson by focusing on the relationship between history and policymaking. That is, we seek to explore the advantages as well as the, the dangers of using historical lessons in making current policy decisions. Now, the project that I, I oversee is, as I mentioned, the North Korea International Documentation Project, or as we call it, NKIDP. It's actually a, uh, a partnership um, between the Wilson Center and the University of North Korean Studies uh, in Seoul. Um, NKIDP is actually one of three projects under the, the umbrella of the History and Public Policy Program. Uh, the other two being the well-known Cold War International History Project, which this year celebrates its 20th anniversary, and the, uh, the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project. Now, all three of these projects deal directly um, uh, with, with newly obtained archival evidence or archival documents from around the world. Uh, for example, the, the, North Korea projects, the North Korea Project gathers documents from um, from the, the former socialist bloc uh, on the inner workings and, and foreign relations of North Korea throughout the Cold War. We have some 60,000 pages, that's excluding South Korean and, and U.S. materials, some 60,000 pages of, of archival documents from Chinese, Russian, Albanian, Romanian, East German, Polish, Hungarian, Czech, I know I'm forgetting a few countries here, um, on uh, the inner workings and foreign relations of North Korea on um, uh, um, uh, North Korea's Cold War. Um, now, we, we translate and then we publish these materials in an effort to advance our understanding um, of, of, of North Korea's own history, um, and also to, to um, uh, recognize um, the, the deep continuities in North Korean history and um, uh, also to demonstrate the importance of history um, to, to North Korean leaders. Um, we find that these materials also reveal a lot about in the history of inter-Korean relations. Uh, so we're actually focusing, that's, that's becoming more and more of a focus here at the center. Um, now recognizing the value um, um, to rising young scholars of, of working with these newly available um, primary source documents, and of, and of using hi historical lessons um, in making current policy decisions, in 2011, the Korea Foundation and the Woodrow Wilson Center um, uh, jointly launched the Korea Foundation um, Junior Scholars Program. Uh, the program provides Korean students currently enrolled in an advanced degree uh, program at, at a non-US university um, an opportunity to spend between three and six months um, in residence at the Wilson Center, um, conducting uh, advanced research on an important public policy issue or a topic in contemporary Korean history. Now, the, the Korea Foundation Junior Scholars have full access to the vast collection of, of, of archival documents that 
um, uh, the history and public policy uh, program have, have, has, has obtained. And uh, they're also given full access to um, uh, all of the other uh, resources available at, at the Wilson Center. This includes, of course, our outstanding library, um, constant interaction with, with uh, fellow Wilson Center scholars, many of whom I, I'm, I'm happy to see here today. Um, uh, a standing invitation to all of the Wilson Center's 750 plus events um, uh, that we hold you know, annually. And they also have borrowing privileges um, uh, from the Library of Congress, which is actually home to the largest collection of North Korean um, publications in the, in the US for sure. I would even say in the world, um, outside of North Korea, of course. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, the, the Korea Foundation Junior Scholars Program is only one of the, the, the many things that, that the Wilson Center does with the Korea Foundation. Um, uh, we, uh, the, in fact, the Korea Foundation generously um, supports uh, much of our, our career-related programming um, at the Wilson Center, um, not just uh, carried out by the History and Public Policy Program, but also by the Center's Asia Program. Um, I'm happy to say, I'm very proud to say, that actually, that, that, the, that Korea is actually taking on a, a much larger role um, here at the Wilson Center. Um, again, with the generous support of the Korea Foundation, the Wilson Center is currently developing a modern Korean history portal um, that will function uh, as both a learning and a research tool for students, educators, and, and professional uh, historians. Um, this April, um, uh, uh, the Wilson Center's president and CEO, Jane Harmon, will actually be traveling to Korea uh, to hopefully raise the profile of the center in, in, in Korea. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two um, junior scholars uh, who are part of the inaugural class of, of, scholar, of, of junior scholars, and um, of course, our, 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 my good friend, uh, our commentator, um, Ria Che is a PhD candidate in modern Korean history at Seoul National University. Her dissertation and research focuses on uh, inter-Korean relations in the 1970s. Uh, she has previously taught um, as a lecturer at Seoul National University and at Dunguk University. Uh, she earned her, her BA um, in international studies and an MA in anthropology uh, from Seoul National University. Um, Taeryang Lee, is an MA candidate in Peace and Security Studies in the Graduate School of, Inter of, of, of International Studies at Korea University. Uh, her re research focuses on the institutionalization of Kim Il-sung's authority in North Korea uh, uh, from 1967 onwards. Uh, she earned her BA uh, in law from Hanguk University of Foreign Languages. And our commentator today um, is, uh, is, is Professor um, Kim Jae Ryu um, from the University of North Korean Studies, where he is a, a, an associate professor? No. Your full professor. <laughs> I promoted. Pro <laughs> professor. Tenured <laughs> professor. <laughs> Ten at, uh, at the University of North Korean Studies, which is our partner institution um, in Korea. He is uh, currently studying um, the domestic politics and foreign relations of North Korea from 1965 to 1974. Uh, he's also presently a member of the Policy Advisory Committee to the Senior Secretary of the President um, and to the Ministry of Unification. Um, he is also the Chair of the Committee of North Korea and Unification uh, the, and, and the Korea Association of International Studies. Um, so uh, you have each 20 minutes. Um, I will be very strict. <laughs> so. Op open with, uh, with, with Ria. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my presentation. Uh, as uh, James said, the time is very strict, so <laughs> I will start right away. Uh, my presentation is about the uh, August 18, 1976 incident uh, when a group of uh, South, five South Korean workers uh, escorted by two American and several security guards went into the joint security area located in the demilitarized zone on the border between North and South Korea uh, to trim the tree. Uh, I will, so if you can see this small blue dot, this is a tree. <coughs> the tree was blocking um, the view between two UN observation posts. 
Um, <coughs> As the workers were working on the tree, uh, a group of about 10 North Korean soldiers arrived in a truck and inquired about the work in progress. Uh, upon receiving the response trimming the tree, uh, one North Korean officer said good. Uh, but after about 10 minutes, he uh, ordered that the, walk, the work is halted. And when the American officer ignored uh, North Korean command, then uh, North Koreans went back to their post and uh, returned with about 20 additional security guards and immediately attacked American officers with the axes which the workers left under the tree, as well as with clubs. And they bit two American officers to death. Uh, there were no casualties on the North Korean side. Um, the entire incident or attack lasted for about 80 seconds to two minutes. Uh, and it was filmed on a video camera, which was very rare at the time when they didn't have cyber borders. Um, and uh, that's why we have these pictures here today. Uh, Washington decided to take a measured response uh, in response to the incidents. It raised the troop alert level, uh, moved in uh, fighter airplanes and uh, the, uh, an aircraft carrier and conducted a bombing exercise while uh, carrying out an operation uh, to cut down the tree. Uh, the operation took place on August 21st, uh, three days after the incident. And on the same day, uh, Kim Il-sung, president of North Korea, issued an unprecedented statement, uh, which he said that the incident was regretful, which the United States accepted as a formal apology. And the incident, which raised the tensions on the Korean Peninsula to a near war situation came to an end. Um, this so-called Panmunjom uh, ex-murder incident uh, was very well publicized. It's appeared in press a lot around the world at that time. Uh, both South Koreans and uh, foreign historians are well aware of the incident. But somehow, with the exception of military historians who tend to focus on the incident itself or the subsequent military operations, the incident uh, didn't attract a lot of attention. And uh, I believe that this is because uh, most scholars, historians, would focus on other events in the 1970s, which they believe were more important uh, for the to describe the situation in the peninsula, as well as uh, because there is a general agreement that the incident was an accident and thus wouldn't tell us much about the trends um, in East Asia at that time. So what I will try to do in my presentation is to uh, put the incident into a broader framework of inter-Korean relations uh, to show that it was not an accident. And in fact, it was quite representative of the inter-Korean relations of the time. Uh, moreover, uh, I will argue that the incident points to a very important turning point in the Cold War uh, structure of relations between the two Koreas and of their relations with their respective patrons with the United States and China. Uh, here is the list of the list of the sources which I was using for my research. These include the documents from the uh, North Korea International Documentation Project Archive, uh, critical oral history conference proceedings. Uh, interviews with uh, former South Korean officials and North Korean defectors, as well as video interviews and memoirs of eyewitnesses. Uh, so after the incident, uh, there were roughly four types of argument of what it was. Uh, premeditated North Korean attack, premeditated U.S. attack, accident provoked by the United States, and accident provoked, provoked by North Korea. As it can be expected, the initial reaction was uh, the United States and North Korea blaming each other. Why did you have cameras there if you didn't expect the attack? Or why did you, uh, right, for example, Kim Il-sung was absent from an important national conference on the day of the accident? Um, well, the North Korea International Documentation Project uh, contains an excellent uh, collection of the finger pointing um, uh, cables. So I will not stop on it uh, in detail. But uh, as time passed by, more parties started to reinterpret the incident as an accident. Uh, the socialist camp uh, interpreting it in terms of overreaction because of the fanatical feelings of hate that North Korean military had towards Americans. Uh, while liberal camp was looking at 
the incident and thinking North Korea didn't really gain anything from the incident. Why would it plan an attack which would backfire on it so badly? So now I will try to reject three of these arguments to show that it was not an accident and it was not a U.S. premeditated attack. Well, the last argument is the easiest one to reject because there is no evidence for the, uh, that the United States planned it somehow. Uh, Kissinger and Defense Department were clearly surprised by the attack. Uh, camera, cameras were there as a precaution measure taken personally by the American officer who decided to trim the tree. And uh, besides, if you think about the situation of that year, 1976 is an election period, um, the United States is in the middle of rapprochement with China. Uh, it's considering reduction of troops, if not the withdrawal of troops from the Korean Peninsula. So raising tensions in the peninsula was clearly not in the U.S. interests. Uh, secondly, it couldn't be an accident uh, because North Korean soldiers would not have uh, attacked Americans without <coughs> uh, command of the higher um, positioned officers. Uh, specifically, in 1967, after uh, North Korean military accidentally sank a South Korean escort boat, uh, Kim Il-sung issued an order saying that in the future nobody can open fire on a target without Kim Il-sung's approval. Uh, chances are, are uh, there would be other accidents if it were an accident, but as you see on this table, the number of incidents uh, in 1976 was relatively small. And in fact, we know just one other accident when a North Korean newspaper man uh, attacked uh, uh, an American officer in the Joint Security Area. So as I mentioned earlier, the most, um, the strongest argument for the accident theory is why would North Korea plan the attack so badly? And this actually could be explained in terms of amateur planning and then point to someone else, someone other than Kim Il-sung as the mastermind of the attack. In fact, all the North Korean defectors who I talked to, they uh, believed that Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung's son, was behind the uh, attack. He was the one who ordered it because he just got, at that time, uh, decision-making power in the North Korean military. And he also conspicuously disappears from media and for spotlight and from decision making for some time shortly after the incident. Um, then this leaves us with a choice of premeditated North Korean attack. Uh, in fact, it was quite easy to expect uh, that United States troops would come to trim that particular tree because they had come uh, to do it earlier on August 6th. Uh, the North Korean soldier who ordered, the, who started the attack, Park Chol, was uh, pretty much familiar to the South Korean witnesses uh, to the event, and they state that he was behaving differently from uh, usual on that particular day. Uh, he was very aggressive, and he didn't interact. Uh, the North Korean jeep on the scene, on the scene had X handles in it. Also, Kim Il Sung refused to punish soldiers. Uh, instead saying that they should be praised as patriots. As for the timing of the event, uh, <coughs> immediately prior to the uh, um, incident, uh, North Korea embarked on a major intensification campaign of its um, uh, of, uh, campaign against the presence of uh, U.S. troops in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so on August 5th, it issued a statement that the United States had completed war preparations and was entering into a phase of directly triggering war. And uh, the incident also took place as a non-aligned conference was taking place in Colombo. And North Korea was preparing for a major confrontation with South Korea at the United Nations. So then, what did North Korea try to achieve through this attack? Uh, first, let us look at the... Uh, developments in the inter-Korean relations in the, in the early 1970s. So uh, North Korean, North-South Korean talks start in 1971. On July 4, 1972, North and South Korea uh, declare their own declaration of independence. Uh, it's a joint statement where they promise to take steps towards mutual uh, trust building. But from there, uh, talks go off track as North Korea uh, makes demands which are um, which South Korea is not willing to accept, and neither party wants to compromise. 
then uh, virtually by 1974, the talks stalled. Uh, at the same time, both countries, North and South, tried to use the situation of detente in the international system to reach towards the countries of the opposite camp to establish relationship with them and thus push and isolate the other side so that they can continue negotiations from the position of strength. Uh, this led to a wave of international campaigns, diplomatic campaigns in the third world, uh, resulting in strong debates over the Korean issue at the United Nations General Assembly. And the climax was uh, reached at the 1975, a year uh, earlier, uh, UN General Assembly, when two contradictory uh, and contents resolutions, one in favor of South <coughs> Korea and another one in favor of North Korea, were adopted at the same time. Um, around the time of the Stalin in inter-Korean talks, North Korea realized that the talks would not help it destabilize Park chung regime uh, because of the regime in South Korea uh, and thus uh, achieve peaceful reunification by a rise in oppositional movement. On the contrary, uh, South Korean regime was Sorry, okay. A South Korean regime seemed to consolidate it, its uh, grip on the um, country during the talks. Also, Pyongyang thought that Seoul didn't have independent uh, policy of its own. And uh, it was the United States military and economic uh, support that prevented North Korea from influencing the South. Pyongyang was also aware about the uh, concerns that the United States had over uh, the issues of democracy and human rights in South Korea and knew of the deliberations inside the United States whether to continue large-scale support for the country and stationing troops in Korea. Um, events in Vietnam and Cambodia also seem to show that uh, militaristic revolutionization approach was, uh, could produce the desired results. So Pyongyang was contemplating on returning to militaristic approach to the issue of unification. In 1975, Kim Il-sung travels to Beijing, <coughs> uh, where he wanted to ask for necessary support and resources, but <laughs> Deng Xiaoping implicitly told him that uh, PRC was not going to support his uh, new military adventure. Instead, uh, the PRC leadership promised continuing pressuring the United States uh, to withdraw its troops from the Korean Peninsula. And that was the point which, the, uh, which Kim Il-sung and Pyongyang couldn't help by doubt, because uh, the promise seemed to be only in words. True, initially China put the, um, uh, the, the issue of withdrawal of uh, United, troops, United States troops from Korea on the agenda of negotiations with the United States, but uh, soon, about, I would say, 1974, rumors spread in both camps that the United States, fearing of the expansion of Soviet influence in the Korean Peninsula, in reality didn't want the United States troops to withdraw. So an event was needed, something which would uh, allow North Korea to have direct negotiations with the United States, uh, which would remind Beijing of its responsibilities and strengthen support for North Korea's position uh, around the world and at the UN. Uh, in spring 1974, uh, North Korea publicized a letter to U.S. Congress where it demanded the U that the United States refrain from insertion of weapons from, uh, from outside and foreign troops stationed in South Korea be abolished and withdrawn. If the U.S. rejected the DPRK initiative, the North uh, would expose them in front of the world public opinion as the main factor hostile to the unification of Korea. So what would expose the United States better than an incident in the joint security area? The entire world would see who the main cause of the tension in the peninsula is. The uh, United States would be in the atmosphere of the election year forced to kind of reconsider the armistice and there was a chance of uh, arriving at a peace treaty with North Korea. Um, awakening message would also be sent to China it would be a force to, confirmed, uh, to confirm its obligations to North Korea and take a stance on withdrawal of U.S. troops. But as we know, the things didn't turn out the way that North Korea intended. Um, Non-aligned nations were not fooled by the way Beijing, uh, Pyongyang 
presented the events, but uh, talked of it as an uh, evidence of North Korean belligerence. Uh, Seoul, of course, didn't miss an opportunity to condemn North Korea. And uh, so many nations turned away from supporting North Korea or took a neutral stance uh, after the incident that North Korea decided to withdraw the draft of the pro-North Korean resolution from the UN. So it may sound like uh, victory for South Korea, but not really, because South, pro-South Korean resolution was also withdrawn as a result of an agreement that if pro-North Korean uh, resolution is withdrawn, then South Korean, a pro-South Korean draft would, uh, would be also withdrawn. Um, the incident and subsequent U.S.-led military operations did uh, question the armistice and uh, drew condemnation mostly from the communist camp uh, for the United States, uh, States' introduction of troops and weapons to the Korean Peninsula. But following negotiations didn't lead to a peace, armistice, uh, to, to a peace agreement as uh, North Korea planned. Uh, PRC was... Uh, uh, put in a very difficult situation. <coughs> um, Beijing was clearly reluctant to take, uh, to engage itself in a campaign which would derail their deterrent course. Um, and if the US chose a hardline position, uh, Ch China would be forced to support North Korea and it would put Beijing in a very weak position relative to vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China's, uh, I'm sorry, Soviet Union's uh, relations with uh, negotiations with the Soviet Union. So eventually China played a role of a pacifier, preventing the incident from escalation by uh, restraining North Korea, asking uh, Kim Il-sung to issue uh, this apology. And in return, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, just a second. Um, so uh, eventually China was, play, uh, was playing a role of pacify. It probably requested Kim Il-sung that he issues this uh, apology uh, towards the United States. And at the same time, the United States uh, was prevented with, from taking a more hardline position on the incident. And instead of driving a wedge between South Korea and the United States, uh, the incident, or more precisely the operation which followed the incident, reaffirmed the strength of military alliance between the two countries. Uh, Seoul also used the incident as a proof that the United States should continuously station its troop he troops here and should support South Korea. Uh, domestically, uh, South Korea, a uh, Park Chung-hee regime, was using the incident as a uh, justification for breaking dialogue with North Korea. North, who could commit such a brutal ta act, could no longer be seen as a negotiation partner, but in uh, President Park's own words, it was a mad dog for whom the best medicine is clubbing. The incident also became a pretext for the regime to crack down on the opposition inside South Korea. Situation of war readiness was also used in North Korea as well. Um, all the unstable elements were moved away from Pyongyang and the allies who didn't pledge um, loyalty to Kim Jong-il, uh, they were purged. So now I'd like to summarize uh, the incident and its aftermath. Uh, it's an it's a oversimplification, but let's imagine it's a boxing match. So in the first round, North Korea challenges the United States authority and JSA and the armistice agreement. It succeeds in doing so. Uh, but in the second round, by offering a strong military response, um, the United States and, uh, China and uh, South Korea reaffirm uh, their military alliance. In the third round, it's a, it's a tie because South and North Korea both compete uh, in Colombo and uh, United Nations General Assembly with, without any results. Then in the fourth round, um, North Korea enters negotiations over the uh, peace treaty, uh, over the armistice, but uh, it fails in arriving at the peace treaty. And finally, at the fifth round, uh, the incident is utilized domestically, both in North and South Korea, uh, but North Korea takes it to a larger scale and uh, uses it as an opportunity to restructure uh, the composition of elites in the direction of Kim Il-sung. So what I tried to show through this oversimplified uh, uh, calculations is that North Korea was not an absolute loser in this game. 
And only by placing the incident in the framework of north-south, north uh, US-China, south US relations, we will be able to break uh, with the idea that the incident was an accident. Uh, the incident finally can tell us about the changes in the Cold War structure at the time. It was the final blow to the detente uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it serves as evidence of intensified competition and confrontation between the two countries. It proceeded in spite of the detente in US-PRC relations. And through the incident, South and North Korea turned farther away from uh, the course of the detente and also were trying to pull their patrons, the United States and China, away from each other. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ria. The last slide is what I thought the north-south relations uh, looked like uh, at the end of the <coughs> incident. But this is the tree. Uh, that's the uh, tree which was finally cut at the end of Operation Paul Bunyan. Great. Thanks, Ria. Yep. <coughs> Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, hello, my name is Cherung Lee, affectionately known by, by Claire in Wilson Center. Um, I'm a junior scholar in, um, from South Korea. Um, today I will present my findings of research, which has focused on the development, establishment of Kim Il Sung's revolutionary tradition and his following institutionalized of charismatic authority. Um, in my presentation, I will examine the development of revolutionary tradition, and also in, um, in the course of examining it, I will argue that his charismatic authority was severely institutionalized based on the cultivation of revolutionary tradition, which North Koreans referred to specifically Kim Il-sung's anti-Japanese struggle in, back in 1930s. I framed um, my research starts from focuses from 1958 to 1980, and I frame those period into two phase one and phase two. And phase I um, will focus more on phase two, so uh, so please bear, bear in mind that if I skip past the first uh, the first phase, <clears throat> so the images like this um, this is the image that um, following the death of Kim Il-sung in 1994. And these kind of images make a lot of people believe that Kim Il-sung's authority was ever, ever unassailable ever since the beginning of this nation building in the 40s. However, um, it is undeniable that he's had a dominating authority and he, he already had an established cult of personality from the 40s, for example, in Starting from 1946, um, there was a university named after him. Also, the major square in the heart of Pyongyang bore the name of Kim Il-sung. <clears throat> However, um, newly available um, diplomatic archives of formal DPRK's allies proved that Kim Il-sung's authority was highly challenged in the, in the 50s and 60s. And I argue that after he finally battled successfully those challenges, his authority and also the cultivation of revolutionary tradition was moved into the new level. So before I discuss what really happened in terms of fabric, uh, cultivating the revolutionary tradition and his authority, let me briefly go over the historical backgrounds, how it happened. So following the death of Joseph Stal Stal uh, Stalin in 1953, um, new Soviet leadership adopted the course that was rejecting the that that they rejected the autarkic policy of Stalin which they focused more on consumer goods and allied industry and this um, new policy later to be called the new course was adopted by um, new Soviet leadership and also was adopted by many countries in the, in the at then Soviet blocs and even within North Korean politics in mid-50s, some party members of Korean Workers' Party, they resonated with this new course. 
those members were Park Chang Wook and Choi Chang Hee and those um, and So Hee. Like the names goes on. And what's important in this period was still within the North Korean politics there were influence of foreign policy and also pluralism. For example, in August '56, there was major confrontation in North Korean history that those members, such as Park chang Wook and Choi chang they confronted against Kim Il-sung's policy um, in August 30 through 31 plenum in 1956. They criticized openly the Kim Il-sung's autarky pol economic policy and building up the pers uh, cult of personality. However, this challenge was suppressed um, instantly because of Kim Il-sung's already pervasive um, political base. And it is interesting that even though he dominant, he battled, he um, he got he purged those members. Only a couple days after, he retracted his decision to repel those members. And I pinpoint that that was because of the influence and criticism by China and the Soviet. Our diplomatic archives proves that. Um, I wanted to share this archive that, I've, um, that I was looking at. This is the um, comments from Mao Zedong, but it doesn't really, um, it clearly, he clearly and severely criticizes Kim Il-sung's policy, even calling him the emperor, unenlightened emperor. Mao Zedong criticized him um, like that. And what's interesting about this article, this archive, is that only after only five days after this criticism, Kim Il-sung retracted his decision in 1950s uh, in, in September, and then and then the purge uh, the, those expelled members came back from China. So, but however, in the midst of Sino-Soviet conflict and then the withdrawal of Chinese voluntary armies, um, Kim Il-sung then uh, when he in 1958 he successfully purged those, completely purged those who challenged his, his authority. And I pinpoint this point, 1958, as the time Kim Il-sung's authority and the cultivation of revolutionary tradition moved into the new level. So in the phase one, I framed from 1958 to 19, uh, 1966, up to 1967, <coughs> um, as the period when revolutionary tradition was was rising in, into new level, so I compared a lot of um, North Korean um, publications, including No Dong Shin Moon and the Joseon Moon Hak and other Kim Il Kim Il Sung's work, and comparison before and after 1958 bears stark differences. For example, I compared mostly the August volumes of those primary sources because. August, is, August 15th is the date when Korea was liberated from Japanese occupation. So I was trying to see the difference in their attitude, and I was quite surprised to see that difference. For example, after 1958, all the revolutionary, uh, there was no reference of, of Soviets liberating Korea, but all the contribution went to the Korean Workers' Party or Kim Il-sung. For example, um, this, um, piece of our uh, article written by Han Seol-ya, who is the most prominent writers of Korean history, North Korean history. He even called, it, uh, by the way, this is the article from 1955, and he even called the Soviet Red Army as the 해방의 구성, which is the factor of liberation. So it was, uh, it was the highest praise he made to, towards Soviet, but this kind of attitude completely disappears from 50, 58. Um, and also, uh, I compared the Kim Il, Kim Il Sung's work and then the volume 12, which is the collection of Kim Il Sung's speeches of that was announced in 1958. It had, it bore 19 times more references towards uh, reference of revolutionary tradition. And also, Reminiscence of anti-Japanese um, partisans started from 1958, and also the Fourth Party Congress in September. Um, they claim the North Korean Workers' Party succeeds great revolutionary tradition. They explicitly mentioned revolutionary tradition as their legitimate a base of legitimacy in 1959. And also, I found this archival documents and from um, from Czech uh, Czech um, Czechoslovak. Uh, who 
based in Pyongyang, and then it clearly said in, from even in 1961 that that this um, cult, uh, North Korean regime is trying to cultivate this revolutionary tradition and based on um, revolutionary tradition. However, it is important that until this first phase, I, um, I argue that the revolutionary tradition was not solely confined to the Kim Il-sung's revolutionary tradition, but rather it was more focusing on the, the Korean workers, the party's revolutionary tradition. Revolutionary tradition. I um, I support this view um, through, with my um, examination of publication of primary publications. And until phase one, uh, up to sixty six, there were numerous document. Uh, there were numerous publications and news articles that focused that focused on party's contribution of liberating Korea. For example. Um, this, these are the publications from 66, and um, these are just a part of the examples, but they, they still, t uh, for example, on the Joseon Munhaks, they uh, featured a novel, uh, Until the Party is Alive. It is a revolutionary novel that is praising the party's contribution to liberate North Korea. And also another article with full of text, it's about um, Chaehyun, Jen, Chaehyun, Comrade Chaehyun, and his contribution to liberate Korea. And this kind of trends, you will have very hard time finding it after 67. So moving on to 67, from this period, um, North Korean prim, uh, publications bear very different attitudes towards Kim Il-sung's contribution to revolutionary tradition, therefore his authority as well. So this is the, artic, uh, the picture that I found from Joseon Munak uh, from 67. This is, just one, this is just one example from numerous consecutive idolizing Kim Il-sung's uh, contribution to revolutionary tradition. You um, just compare with the 66, it does not mention one thing about Kim, Kim Il-sung's contribution. However, from 67, the first page starts with Kim Il-sung's, it doesn't say it's Kim Il-sung, but obviously, yeah. So it's, there is a different attitude, and I will uh, sh show these with um, examples. And also, um, one archival document that I found, it clearly states that this archive from GDR uh, in Pyongyang, he, um, this, diplomat, uh, uh, this diplomat archives clearly states that the personality cult of Kim Il-sung Took on, moved on to the next level, like legendary level. You can, um, and it's important to see that um, not, the diplomatic archive not only talks about his heightened authority, but it mentions that it was based on the revolutionary tradition. So, again, the, there is a back, uh, his, historical background of this. Um, this moving on to the. Uh, Next level, I pinpoint that as uh, I, I argue that that was based on the purge of Gapsan in 1967. So the purge of Gapsan was not a real confrontation of the party members, just like what happened in 1957. However, um, there, um, there were um, couple, several members of the party who were purged in 67, and I and I found the reasons for their purge, and the, their, the causes of their purges were they distorted the party policy and criticized our party's glorious revolutionary tradition. And also they proposed that the revolutionary tradition of the party should be, they, um, they basically rejected revolution, uh, building up the revolutionary tradition based on Kim Il-sung. And I found this um, archival documents in the, in the bottom, and I think this is quite significant. Um, this is the diplomatic archive from Bucharest, Romania, and then he says um, this diplomat describes the, the, the cause of their purge as Park geum those who, um, the major figure who was purged, did not accept the development, cultivating the revolutionary tradition, discrediting the other members' contribution, but solely basing, uh, solely focusing the um, cultivate and solely focusing on Kim Il-sung's contribution. So after, um, after this purge, um, 
from six to seven, there has um, there were um, numerous evidences that Kim Il Sung's revolutionary tradition was uh, moved into the next level. For example, Korean Workers Party's History Research Center was changed to Kim Il Sung's History Research Center, and it was the reservoir for Kim Il, um, for cultivating Kim Il Sung's revolutionary tradition. And also, do um, Hangil Yugyeokde Shiguro do you like uh, anti Japanese guerrillas? This is quite. Uh, this is fairly um, popular slogan in North Korea, and this was coined. And during this time, you can see in the picture it was, act, uh, <coughs> it was. Oh, it was. This whole structure was built in 1960. It's yeah. Maybe you can see it. <laughs> um, and also, um, so Kim Jong Il's speech, such as. Um, I will have to skip a little bit. So, for example. Um, revolutionary memorial sites were reorganized during this time. For example, this um, Samjiyeon, this is the Samjiyeon revolutionary sites, and um, were reorganized. You, uh, I will have to skip the rest part. And also in 1972, North Korea revised constitution the first time after the 40s, and it clearly, <clears throat> excuse me, it clearly said that DPRK is the revolutionary regime whose, who succeeds glorious tradition of fighting for liberty and happiness for Korean people against imperialist offenders. So it, it, uh, <clears throat> it clearly um, traced back its legitimacy from from anti-Japanese struggle, and that it, they institutionalized the context in, in the constitution in 1972. And also, interestingly, they changed the date of the Korean People's Army to April 25th. And then according to the examination of Nodong Shinmun, that the reason being was because Korean work, People's Army, Korean People's Army's origin comes from anti-Japanese struggle. They're clearly making the link between the, um, they're clearly claiming the legitimacy of the army based on the anti-Japanese struggle, which is, was later on cultivated as anti-Japanese uh, revolutionary tradition. And also they, in 1974, they um, established a new party bylaw, which is known to, which is known as <coughs> 10 Principles for Establishment of Monolithic Ideological System. And it is important that uh, Article 1 is the most important um, art, um, part that I believe is. Um, it says, in order to color the whole society with, uh, with great suryeok, which is Kim Il-sung's re uh, revolutionary, uh, revolutionary ideology, we have to fight to the death. So basically, the monolithic ideological system is the base for fostering Kim Il-sung's autarkic um, authority. And the Article 1 clearly claims that um, Kim Il Sung's, um, the, um, in order to color the whole society with Kim Il Sung's revolutionary ideology, we have to fight to the death. But this, in this article, revolutionary ideology means Juche ideology. But however, I, um, this Juche ideology claims its origin to, and, uh, to the uh, anti Japanese struggle, and then the cultivating uh, revolutionary tradition bridged that gap between. Juche, uh, between the Kim Il Sung's revolutionary ideology and Juche. So, another point that I wanted to make in this in this period is that rev the revolution, cultivating the revolutionary tr tradition, expands to that of Kim Il Sung families. So, not only um, cultivation focused on Kim Il Sung, but from this period, phase two. It expands to his family. For example, major North Korean propaganda canonized um, canonized not only Kim uh, not only Kim Il Sung but also his family. And also, um, one diplomatic archive um, proved, um, reports that this Cambodian diplomat was asked to um, put down the wrath in front of his parents and great parents' tomb. So that was very interesting. And also. Um, in the 67 volume, the song Mother of, of Joseon was featured. So, and this song um, goes, not only canonized the person of Kang Ban Seok, uh, of a mother, but it says the mother lived for the revolution, the struggle for revolution. So it clearly links the 
revolution, uh, family with the revolutionary tradition. And also, it claims that Kim Il-sung's great father, great great great-grandfather Kim Jong-un was the one who fought against General Sharman in 1866. And also the monuments were built regarding his family and also family idol, sorry, family idolization expanded to Kim's great parents in 1968. I argue that the, um, I argue that the Expansion of revolutionary tradition to Kim Il Sung's family was not to point, was not to focus uh, on Kim Il Sung family's hereditary privilege, but rather than to focus on the Kim Il Sung family's hereditary charisma that I um, that I conceptualized, which was to focus on the exceptional quality of Kim Il Sung's family that runs through. Kim, uh, that runs through his family. And also, idolizing family's um, tradition efficiently uh, legitimized the idea of generation to generation, which is tetero, and that it later on w was institutionalized into North Korean system, I will uh, which I will discuss in a minute. And another interesting development in this phase too was uh, the cultivation of a revolutionary tradition also um, Affected the affected the rise of uh, Kim, Il, Kim Jong Il's rise to power, and and it was it was not only directly affected by the development of cultivating the tra tradition, but also Kim Jong Il played a big part in building the tradition by himself. For example, 1967, he was a, uh, he was appointed as a director of director of culture and art division in Department of Propaganda and Agitation. And in, um, after he was assumed to this position, he proved, he performed extensive works in art and culture section. For example, um, I will just skip this. These are the examples, but just to um, summarize a little bit of his performance, most of the works regarding Kim Il Sung's um, revolutionary tradition, those are uh, staying in the realm of Kim Il Jong Il's performance, um, especially those um, fabricating the history and fabricating the revolutionary culture and arts. Those are on the direct. Those are under the direct guidance of Kim Jong Il. For example. Um, five greatest revolutionary opera in North Korea still is claimed to be the five greatest opera as those are um, those are explicitly claimed to be the uh, the result of Kim Jong Il's art artwork in when he was assumed as a um, chief director of uh, Department of Propaganda and Agitation. And also he launched a new project of re-establishing revolutionary historical sites that I mentioned earlier. Those were all directed under the Kim Jong-il's guidance. And one of the interesting points that I want to make is that Kim Jong-il's contributions to cultivate Kim, um, revolutionary tradition was highly focused on the cultivating artwork. And for example, um, he, um, the Sea of Blood that one of the legendary opera and novel in North Korean society, the, those artwork was not brand, was not deemed as just a cultural work, but it was, oh, okay, but it was deemed as one of the greatest contributions to North Korean revolutionary tradition. For example, this article it says it uh, in the first part of the uh, the volume it praises how great is Kim Jong-il's artwork was. And then, interestingly, it moves on to the rationale, it moves on to the argument that there is no country in the world that does revolution, that there is no family in the world that everyone contributes, dedicates their life to revolution. So they branded Kim Jong-il's artwork not just as, a, as an artwork, but they deemed it, they regard it as a, um, as a succession of revolutionary tradition, and this idea was highly was institutionalized in 1970, 1974 that I mentioned earlier in the Article 10. In the Article 10, it clearly says that great leader Kim Il Sung's revolutionary achievements should be succeeded and completed by generation to generation, 
And this generation to generation does not mean just generation to generation of Korean people. It means generations of Kim Il-sung's family. It is evidenced in the um, sub-article. Um, it, it is, this article is followed by, therefore we need to uh, we need to dedicate our lives to the party center. During this time, from 1974, Kim Jong-il was referred to as a party center. So Kim Jong-il was praised. Kim Jong-il's artwork and his contribution to revolutionary works were highly extensively canon, um, praised during 1970 to 1973, and, and it was further institutionalized in this form. So just to um, summarize, so in 1967, he was assumed direct, direct, um, chief director in the cultural and art division in the Department of, of Propaganda and Agitation. And also he did extensive works of cultivating revolutionary tradition and in terms of history and artworks. And also in 1974, he was appointed as secretary of Korean Workers' Party Central Political Committee, and then he was referred to, referred to as party center. And in 19, and he's um, and in 1980, in the Sixth Party Congress, he completed the control over the party by um, being appointed to several positions you can see here. And from this period time, he um, from this time he was referred to the official successor of Kim Il Sung. So, my conclusion. Um, Kim Il uh, cultivating the revolutionary tradition of Kim Il Sung. Not only. Um, fostered Kim Il-sung's um, authority, and also it affected greatly to Kim, Il uh, Kim Jong-il's rise to power. And also, um, rise to power. And also cultivating the revolutionary tradition transformed the transformed struggle of Korea, uh, the whole Korea, into Kim Il-sung's and also Kim Il-sung's family, therefore institutionalizing the hereditary succession within Kim's family. So those are the, um, that was um, it for my arguments. And also, um, these are the sources that I used. I mainly used um, diplomatic archives of NKIDP, and also um, Joseon Munak and other um, North Korean publications, such as Joseon Munak and Nodong Shinmun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jae Um Now, about 10 minutes. Um, Professor Ryu? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, excellent. <laughs> More time for, for questions and answers. Uh, hello, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I or, uh, was staying the, uh, two times, uh, 2007 and uh, the last year. And so, uh, uh, wherever I came here, is I felt the, uh, I, 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 I wore at home, but you know, I fear the uh, the, uh, the trouble. The, the where I speak in English, <laughs> but you know, uh, I'd like to uh, as a co make comment in Korean. Maybe I can give the, the more uh, more accurate the expressions. But uh, you know, uh, I, I, anyway, as I, I, I'm afraid, the, uh, I, I, whether I can convey the the, the exact the, the my idea. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I have the other as the main things to uh, point out the, uh, the regarding the other two papers is very very interesting papers. Uh, but uh, you know I have the other time limit, and so I'd like to uh, make comment. It's just one thing, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Lia and Cheryong is a as a were picked up the. As a junior scholars uh, the sponsored by the Korea Foundation is very uh, uh, good uh, enterprise uh, to uh, bear the other uh, uh, Korean young scholars to uh, uh, to be involved in the uh, uh, NKIDP uh, is very very important uh, uh, the storage of materials to understand uh, the Cold War uh, Korean Peninsula history. And so, uh, as a two uh, as very brilliant uh, young scholars uh, uh, as try to do research, uh, I really, uh, really am pleased. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, the, when I when I wrote the, my dissertation uh, early 1990s, 
uh, at the time the other uh, to to uh, to study the history uh, the regarding North Korea or, or the Korean Peninsula uh, was a fashion <laughs> kind of fashion, very strong fashion. But you know, uh, uh, now now after the uh, five or Maybe, uh, well, I, uh, uh, as far as I know, as far as I remember, after the Kim Dae-jung government, the fashion disappeared. The fashion disappeared suddenly. <laughs> and you know, uh, now it is very, very difficult for us to find uh, uh, students to, uh, uh, to be interested in the, uh, the history. Uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and so uh, I'm really, really glad to see uh, them. And you know, uh, the, I came back from the Woodrow Wilson Center to Korea last August, and then the, I, I saw the, uh, the the North Korean the leadership is uh, moved uh, into the, the from the Kim Jong Il to Kim Jong Un, and you know, uh, December 19th, uh, North Korea has announced the, the Kim Jong Il's death, and then the is very fast and stable the trans, uh, transition, the power tra transition from the Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. And so, and maybe, you know, uh, North Korea is a, is a very enigmatic uh, country to the outside world. But as a, this phenomena is very stable and uh, uh, as a quick, fast, the transition it itself is enigmatic to the outside people, including me. And you know, and we saw we we are seeing the other third hereditary success, the succession. It's a, it's, it's, it itself as uh, a pro problematic and as uh, a difficult to understand. But you know, the maybe Cheryong as uh, can give the other. Uh, hint, hint to understand uh, uh, what happened in North Korea now, uh, and maybe we can uh, understand the uh, the with the, uh, the revolutionary tradition, how the uh, the revolutionary tradition uh, is uh, embedded in North Korean society. But you know. Uh, I think the other, if the other North Korean society and North Korea, the country North Korea, as a will be open to uh, outside world and North Korea will be globalized, and then North Korea cannot evade the other uh, as very uh, substantial change. But if they can maintain the current uh, system, maybe uh, revolutionary tradition uh, can. Uh, as a maker, as a as a as a play a major role in the sustain uh, in sustaining the, the North Korean current regime, and uh, Kim Jong Un's uh, authority, Kim Jong Un's power can be maintained. And anyway, uh, and so uh, uh, and and also the uh, the weekend and uh, Rias Cheryong's uh, uh, Cheryong's uh, uh, finding. Based on Cheryong's finding, that we can expect uh, uh, the uh, Kim Jong Un's. Uh, Cheryong did not mention the other Kim Jong Un, but the, uh, based on Cheryong's finding, that we can expect the other and uh, near term, short term, not not mid term, not long term, but the short term, the North Korean uh, regime uh, the, uh, future. And, and also the other Ria as I showed the uh, uh, very interesting point. Even if the sh even if Ria uh, is uh, uh, focused on the north-south relations and the mid 1970s with the ex mother incident, uh, but she mentioned she mentioned uh, that incident. Is uh, was the uh, linked to the North Korea-China relations, North Korea-U.S. relations, uh, as well as the uh, North-South Korea relations. 
uh, now we see the, the, uh, the North Korea's very clever, clever, well, anyway, it's clever diplomacy with China vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the United States. And you know, now the, it's a common sense, it became common sense that uh, China, I, North Korea, uh, is uh, made use of the provocative actions against United States and uh, South Korea as for the improvement of the as a more strategic relations with China. Uh, for example, 2006, the North Korea is a uh, uh, acted the, the the nuclear test, the first nuclear test, and at the time, the, as many people was sh were shocked, uh, and they thought the, the North Korea provocated against uh, outside world, especially the United States. But the, the target of the, that action can be interpreted, could be interpreted. Uh, uh, in the other, improving the strong alliance with China. And so, uh, even if we don't have as any as a, a convincing uh, documents as a, to, uh, to, to let, let us know the, uh, the ex-mother incident uh, as a, could be, uh, could be the, uh, linked to a uh, uh, North Korea's uh, relations with China, but uh, uh, I, I, I would like to I would like to uh, uh, advise the other Ria is uh, to think about the other uh, ex mother incident as can be played uh, the North Korea's uh, relations with China, and you know uh, I don't have any uh, there is a very uh, firm ground, but. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting uh, case. Uh, and also the, uh, uh, from the 1970s, Pyongyang has uh, started to induce the, the United States to uh, withdraw its troops from the Korean Peninsula. And uh, you know, uh, uh, Pyongyang is uh, converted, transformed the other uh, very uh, 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 animosity uh, against the United States to uh, people's di diplomacy. And so uh, it's a very uh, dual uh, strategy towards the United States. And so uh, uh, North Korea is trying to uh, make dialogue with the United States and uh, uh, ultimately to uh, uh, normalize uh, the, its relations with the United States. It started such a uh, dual strategy in the 1970s. So, uh, ex mother incident uh, in the way of the, uh, the uh, North Korea's uh, new strategy, they acted the other ex mother incident. So, uh, uh, North Korea is uh, trying to uh, uh, making the peninsula troubled area. So. North Korea uh, wanted the United States to uh, to like to uh, make dialogue with North Korea, and that's the uh, reiterated the in the f uh, as now and maybe in the future. As a, I would like to um, uh, make some points is uh, more clear. If I if I if I can speak in uh, Korean, I would like, I can. Uh, convey my idea, but uh, uh, I am afraid yeah. <laughs> I could not uh, convey my idea exactly. Thank you. Uh, but we'll forgive you. He just got off a plane, actually, from <laughs> Korea. Uh, about four hours ago, he landed. <laughs> so, thank you, though, for being so dedicated to volunteer and come in and, and comment. Um, some very useful comments. Um, um, just briefly, really quickly, I want to recognize uh, Director um, Yi Guang Chao from the Korea Foundation, um, uh, who, who helps oversee the the the, uh, the program. Um, but uh, I think we have time for um, about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, wait until you receive the microphone. We are recording this so that the folks who are are listening to the recorded version. 
um, can hear. And also, please identify yourself. <coughs> Hi, my name is Hang Yun Ma. I'm a public policy scholar at the Ujo Wilson Center. Uh, thank you for your very good presentations and uh, and uh, comments from uh, Professor Yu. I have actually a couple of questions. The first one is to uh, Ria Che. Uh, you mentioned uh, that probably uh, North Korea uh, pre-planned the incident. And my question is actually what were the causes of uh, kind of misjudgment on the Pyongyang's part. And that is related to probably to Cheryong's uh, presentation too, because uh, uh, as Professor Yu mentioned, it seems to me that it is uh, enigmatic that the North Korea repeated uh, misjudgment time after time. Mm -hmm. and. What were the reasons for that? Well, you know, ex murder was an uh, incident probably for the benefits of uh, uh, the Pyongyang's interest, but it backfired severely. And it probably, well, probably as uh, Professor Yu explained, uh, North Korea wanted to have a direct talk with the United States, but it didn't really happen. But well, many times afterwards, North Korea did the same thing. So what were the causes of, and reasons for those kind of uh, misjudgment and misassessment of the situation? That is my first question. Then uh, so my second question is about the, the tradition of revolution, well, revolutionary tradition in North Korea. It reminds me of that the well, thinking about the current situation in North Korea, uh, it reminds me of uh, still continuing unity of the regime and the un unity of the country mm -hmm. itself. But uh, recent uh, discussions on the uh, post Kim, Kim Jong Il uh, period in, in North Korea uh, was suggest probably there's a possibility of a plural you know, uh, political forces or politicians or uh, people in, in, the, in the Pyongyang's regime. So I wonder if uh, that kind of uh, uh, well, suggestions are, uh, how that kind of suggest suggestions are uh, to be valued uh, against the, uh, the, the tradition, the revolution, revolutionary tradition that you have uh, presented today. Thank you. Did you want to take a couple questions, or did you want to uh, address them Sorry, one by one? Twenty minutes, so maybe we better. Let's let's take let's. Uh, let me. Uh, any other questions? Understand? Chuck, right, right in front of you. Uh, Ian McMurtry, uh, Wilson Center, and this is just a quick question for Claire. Um, I was curious with the each successive generation of leadership in North Korea, mm -hmm. if it gets, if you feel it gets harder mm -hmm. or easier to continue the revolutionary tradition, as there's more and more of a disconnect mm -hmm. between the leadership and the fact that they're no longer uh, yeah. anti-Japanese Good question. If it's hard to continue establishing mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. is a foundation for their legitimacy. Okay. Why don't you take those, those questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Shall I start? Uh -huh. uh, thank you for a very interesting question. It was uh, one of the major obstacles in my research was dealing with the incident itself. How do I present it? It's, uh, uh, it actually looks like a pre-planned action because North Korea seemed to have much to, would have been much better off if it had its own soldiers killed there in the incident, but instead it was American soldiers who were killed in the incident. So for 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 North Korean cause, it would have been much better if uh, North Korean soldiers were were, uh, were uh, killed in the event. I think that they didn't really pre-plan well the event itself. Uh, that was the, one of the major uh, reasons for the, the for the incident to backfire. Uh, first of all, they 
didn't expect that uh, the, there would be no um, reinforcements from the United States side and that uh, the uh, American officers wouldn't fight back. Actually, the two American officers who were killed were Vietnam War veterans, and they were armed. Although they had only pistols for self-protection, they could have pulled out the guns, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't was because they were under such a strong uh, uh, the regulations that they shouldn't use guns until they really are about to die. And you know, probably the, the, uh, by the time they realized that they were about to die, it was too, too, too late for them to uh, take their um, weapons in self-defense. Uh, also, North Korea really didn't expect the cameras to be on the place of the incident. Uh, otherwise, I think they would tr have tried to uh, portray the incident the other way, but once it was, uh, it, uh, it was released that the cameras were there and everything was taped, then North Korea was really started to back off from the incident. Uh, this is about the incident itself. As for the international relations, I think there was a major <coughs> miscalculation on the China's position. And, uh, North Korea, I think, was expecting to um, kind of give an awakening message to, to Beijing and was hoping that uh, Beijing would have to move towards, away from the United States, towards North Korea, reconfirm its ties, and it didn't happen. Uh, China didn't, wasn't ready to sacrifice for, for, for North Korea its uh, uh, detente uh, course with uh, the United States. So they just decided on a kind of deal. Okay, we allow, uh, women's Beijing allow North Korea to talk directly within, uh, we approve of the direct negotiations with the United States, but instead you guys apologize for what you did on that, uh, on, uh, on August 18th, and we will ask the United States not to be too harsh on you. That's what happened, and um, probably, well, if Kim Il-sung had been planning that, I think he would have planned it better, but uh, I believe that he was not behind uh, the incident. Um, I'll answer to uh, Ian's question first. Um, that was a very uh, interesting question, and is, is it easier for the, the um, next successor to cultivate and to succeed the revolutionary tradition. I believe it can be analyzed in a two spheres. For, um, but one thing I want to make uh, note is that Kim Il-sung never really partake in a real anti-Japanese struggle. But how he cultivated that revolutionary tradition was that, well, he later on after 1980, he created that the, his birthplace uh, myth that he was born in um, in Baek-tusan, like Miryong. But, but other than that, during the, the period that I examined, when he's, the revolutionary tradition was institutionalized into Kim Il-sung's family, there was no accounts of Kim Jong-il partaking in the anti-Japanese struggle. However, as I pointed out in the, uh, in, the, in the presentation, he institutionalized the idea of generation to generation and also the hereditary hereditary charisma, which means hereditary exceptional qualities, not the hereditary privilege. So I was arguing that North Korean regime and Kim Jong-il's claim for authority was not based on the hereditary privilege that, run, that, used, that used to be practiced in um, traditional dynastic empire, but rather it was based on Kim Jong-il's contribution to, to um, keep developing revolutionary tradition in terms of his artwork, revolutionary art they refer to, revolutionary history, which which I conceptualize, uh, which is conceptualized as revolutionary tradition. So, being uh, being far away from the real family and real people who fought in anti-Japanese struggle, I don't think that's the key to analyze. It is hard to, or easier. Um, but another, uh, but, but the only difference is that that answers to um, Professor Ma's question that uh, connects to Professor Ma's. Um, Kim. Uh, these, um, these days, they, North Korean, there's many news sources that they say um, North Korean regime will turn into a collective leadership. And I was actually asked in the Wilson Center uh, by a lot of people that, do I believe that Kim Jong-un will successfully be uh, a next leader of, Kim, of North Korea? But um, how I see the problem, how I see this phenomenon is that, as I argued in my presentation, that idea of generation to generation of Kim Il-sung's family's revolutionary tradition and Kim Il-sung's 
family's authority was institutionalized in the monolithic ideological system, and the Article 10, it says, revolutionary tradition must be succeeded by generation to generation, which means Kim Il-sung family's generation to generation. And therefore, I see no problem Kim Jong-un succeeding as a sole leader, official leader. However, also I point, as I pointed out in my presentation, Kim Jong-il walked his way up by his cultivating the revolutionary tradition and ideological works in, cult, in culture and art division. So that's the stark difference between Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. Although Kim Jong-il, uh, because Kim Jong-il walked his way up by himself cultivating that, that tradition, it, it built his way up in, within the party and also legitimized his authority. But however, Kim, although that family tradition of Kim's family has been uh, institutionalized, Kim Jong-un lacks that. Kim Jong-un lacks that um, performance which Kim Jong-il has been, had been practicing from 19, 1967, I pointed out, but Kim Jong-il lacks that walking, up, walking within the party by himself. I quickly wanted to share this, um, this archive um, that is newly available archive that's from um, 1961, and then it's an Albanian archive. And I was surprised to see this archive because it already mentions Kim Jong-il, Kim, Il Kim Il-sung's son. He played a major role in ideological, uh, he earned great respect from already in the ideological thinkings, people's thinking. With, this is clear example that Kim Jong, what Kim Jong-un lacks. He was 20 by the time he, this, this diplomatic archive was mm -hmm. reported. Do you want to say something about that? You're, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, there are lots of uh, stories about uh, regarding the, the Kim Jong Un, but you know, uh, uh, we don't have any uh, specific uh, knowledge about the Kim Jong Un. Uh, Kim Jong Il, you know, uh, uh, the Chaeryong, as uh, as told, as she told, uh, uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong Il, as uh, we knew, uh, lots of things. Uh, in his uh, youth, uh, even the other, in his childhood. And many people, as uh, I witnessed, gave us uh, eyewitness, uh, 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 however it, uh, convincing. But anyway, uh, but Kim Jong-un, uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, uh, the cook of Japan, as, uh, who has uh, worked uh, more, uh, almost 18 years for the Kim Jong Il's uh, family, uh, early 1980s, Fujimoto Genji, a Japanese cook, and he uh, he told us, uh, and early 2000, he uh, gave he published a book, uh, the Kim Jong Il's family, but at the time, as a not nobody, but as a few people believed believed his. Uh, I witness his estimation on Kim Jong Un. At the time, uh, Fujimoto Genji, uh, as, a, as a told us uh, convincingly, the Kim Jong Il selected Kim Jong Un as the the next leader. But at the time, many people as uh, were interested in India, the the first son. Uh, Kim Jong Nam, who live in the yeah, Macau and Beijing, and the second son Kim Jong Chol, uh, but uh, not interested in yeah, the third son. But third son <laughs> is a rose the yeah, uh, the new leader is uh, 2008, as uh, after the Kim Jong Il's stroke. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> so my point is yeah, the the. Uh, Clearly, the uh, revolutionary tradition is very, very important. And also, the other revolutionary tradition as was elaborated by Kim Jong-il himself, as, as the uh, Chae Ryong said. But uh, uh, now, the, other, the, the hereditary succession itself uh, shows that uh, uh, the North Korean political system, uh, the new the hereditary succession 
uh, was done based on the embedded uh, revolutionary tradition. The revolutionary tradition is embedded the other on and the other North Korean society and culture. But it is very, very uh, the brittle. As I mean the other, when the North Korea were open its society to outside world, the North Korean revolution tradition uh, can be the scatter. As I don't know, <laughs> but anyway, it's my view. <laughs> Great. Um, any additional questions? Um, of could I hear our also at Wilson Center? Uh, my question goes to Ria. Uh, this uh, uh, ex massacre incident. I mean, if uh, uh, Kim Jong Il was behind the incident, as you suggested. Why would you say that? I mean, why, uh, you know, why did he do that, would you say? I mean, simply, um, he was an heir apparent by then. And the, uh, you know, why did he order the attack? I mean, in that particular brutal manner, I mean, by using Nexus. And Yuri, you had a question? Uh, yes. Y Yuri, um, uh, Kim is, is actually, uh, she is another uh, Korea Foundation junior scholar. She joined us. More recently, um, she'll uh, be with us for six months. I'm Yuri, another <coughs> the third junior scholar here in, in West Center. Uh, my question is very small for Ria. Well, while you were presenting um, in your presentation, it was really interesting to reframing those incidents by chronological order and uh, in the, all those relationships with other countries. But there was a slide uh, you mentioned um, the boxing match, you reorganized it, that instant into bo boxing match, and there were some, at the first round, it was uh, North Korea, the second round, it was on the other side, and third round, was zero to zero or something. But the point was, the third, the first uh, round was one to zero, and the second round was zero to two. <laughs> and kind of, uh, how did you calculate those points one and two, so to which one won and the other were defeated? Uh, then let me, um, if I can, just ask some quick questions too. Number one, to, to Ria, um, you mentioned that uh, Boniface, um, this U.S. officer, had actually you know prepared the cameras. Uh, and this is something that the North Koreans were pointing to. You know, of course, it was an American um, uh, yeah, provocation because they even had all these cameras set up. Any evidence that that, that Boniface had had ordered this done before? Um, you know, at any other. Um, uh, you know, any other during any other operations, uh, uh, be it tree trimming or, or anything. Um, then to uh, to Chaeryang, um, why the between um, the 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 1956, you know, the uh, August incident or this, you know, uh, between that and why did it take two years, um, you know, for your for your research? What happened um, over this period? Why couldn't Kim Il Sung act immediately um, to? Uh, you know, build up the, the revolutionary tradition. Um, what limitations were there? Um, also, uh, what, what will Kim Jong-un's contribution to the revolutionary tradition be? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'll try to answer as quick as I can because I know that we are running out of time, but it's very interesting, all three questions. Thank you very much. Uh, about the first question of uh, the uh, Kim Jong Il's intentions um, behind the uh, incident, if he did. Uh, I do, do not say conclusively that he did, but uh, all the informants I talked with and uh, uh, some other sources uh, show that uh, um, Kim Jong Il is believed to be behind this attack. So, uh, again, there are two lines of uh, interpretation if he were um, the mastermind, what did he try to achieve? And uh, one line is that. Uh, there is a mm, rec record of uh, one uh, um, person who was a former military officer in North Korea, defected to South Korea, and he said that he was there when uh, Kim Jong-il ordered it, and uh, uh, it happened, and the situation was like um, Kim Jong-il uh, received a report that on earlier, from two weeks before, that on August uh, 6th, uh, the group, August 5th, uh, the group of uh, officers, American officers and Korean workers tried to cut the 
tweet down without asking North Korea's permission. And Kim Jong-il became very angry about it, and he said, do something about it. Uh, you can even kill them. I don't care. Just don't use weapons. And uh, so that's, uh, don't use the guns, he meant. So that's, that's one explanation. I tend to doubt that, and I think that another possibility to explain Kim Jong-il's order could be that he was trying himself as a military leader, and it was not a successful attempt. Very shortly before uh, the incident, Kim Jong-il restructured the military reporting system inside the North Korean army so that he gets reports uh, on, the, on everything which was happening in the army before, ahead of Kim Il-sung. And then Kim Jong-il decides what to report to Kim Il-sung and what not. So it, uh, he had the decision-making power, and I think it was his unsuccessful um, attempt to use it. Then uh, second, uh, subjective calculations. Uh, well, the calculations, yeah, are very subjective see, here on the slide. Uh, there are several points which I, ha I had to skip because uh, of the time limits of my presentation. And the reason why I um, put some weights, more weights to uh, give, give South Korea more points here uh, is because it's a kind of double revenge that South Korea and the United States uh, achieve through the military operation. It's not only that the United States regains authority in the, in the joint security area, it also shows the strength of alliance to South Korea, to other nations, uh, other allies who might have been doubting uh, United States uh, commitments after the Nixon doctrine in Asia and so on. And also South Korea had got its own chance for revenge. Um, the South Koreans, uh, uh, South Korean martial art experts were invited to take part in uh, the tree cutting operation. And although they were instructed specifically not to bring any, any weapons, they brought weapons and uh, they uh, used those weapons to destroy North Korean posts. So I think that small revenge of uh, South Korea should be also counted as one point. Mm -hmm. Finally, really quickly about <laughs> um, James' question. Uh, honestly, I don't have anything in writing yet, <clears throat> but I talked to uh, Mr. Lee Dong-bok, who is the major, um, uh, who, who, who who, said, who is uh, collecting a lot of material about this uh, Panmunjom incident. And he said that according to his personal investigations, uh, Boniface did order uh, those cameras to be there because it was Captain Boniface who actually <coughs> led the previous attempt to cut down the tree two weeks before the Panmunjom um, incident. Thank you. Um, the questions, your first question that why it took two years like even though the uh, confrontation started in 1956, um, August, how, how how come it took two years? And I framed from 1958. I briefly uh, mentioned in my presentation that I believe um, until mid um, 50s and up to 58 um, in North Korea within the uh, domestic polit uh, domestic North Korean politics, still there were influence, uh, quite a strong influence of. China and the Soviet, and they played a big, uh, big role. Um, they pl they definitely influenced internal uh, decision making process. For example, I showed uh, I uh, shared an archive from Mao Zedong, and the, he cr clearly uh, severely criticized Kim Il Sung for being an emperor, being a not a, he does not espouse democracy, mm -hmm. and those kind of criticism actually changed internal decision making process, and it shows that still at the time. North Korea had that uh, was influenced by other um, superpowers, but however, in the midst of um, Sino-Soviet conflict, um, they did not have full energy to focus on and control over North Korea, and then China would actually withdrew their voluntary armies. So, those kind of uh, international fabrics of uh, in fabrics of international. Um, policy relations contributed to uh, North, North Korean policy, and Kim, Kim Il-sung successfully managed and maneuvered that internal politics using that conflict. And also another, uh, your second question, what, what Kim Jong-un can contribute? I actually put it in my writings that the, the origin of revolutionary tradition is not separable <coughs> from nationalistic national um, idea, nationalism, because 
The origin of the revolutionary tradition is fighting against the anti um, fighting against Japan, which is surely libera uh, national liberation. So I uh, I believe if North Korea and Kim Jong Un. Um, so therefore, nationalism and the revolutionary tra tradition is very interconnected. Therefore, if Kim Jong-un can prove that he can safely protect North Korea and then make it a prosperous country, just like Kang, the idea of Kang Song Daegu, he has done his, he could, he could claim that he has done his share. And I do believe that, even though I haven't done extensive research, the previous years on um, provocative uh, militarism in North Korea is not um, is quite relevant to the rise of Kim Jong Un, which a lot of um, scholars um, analyze as well, because and revolutionary uh, that can be analyzed as as he was if that those provocative actions were successful, if we suppose, then they can also say that Kim Jong Un was contributing to the building of the revolutionary tradition up to now. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for your excellent presentations and uh, to, to Kije for your, your comments. Um, and thank you both um, uh, so much for everything you've done for me and for the project over uh, throughout you know, the time that you've, you've been here at the Wilson Center. You've become strong members of the Wilson Center family. Um, Taehyung, I think, knows more people at the Wilson Center than I do, um, uh, <laughs> staff and, and scholars included. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, you'll be missed um, by many. And um, you've really set a very high standard for future uh, Korea Foundation junior scholars. Um, so thank you both. Um, and uh, please join me in.